Hello, and welcome to the 29th episode of Tissues of the Day. I'm your host, David, and I'm joined today by my hostess with the moistest. <laughs> Today's episode is about the inner child. We're going to chat a bit. We're going to talk about a book that I really like, and then we're going to do some improv. Remember, if you are just listening, that there's video of the podcast on the BitButton YouTube channel and audio wherever you get podcasts. If I remember to pay for the web hosting, <laughs> I'm poor. <laughs> uh, poor. <laughs> it's true, though. Uh, I told Robert um, just yesterday I am going to start full time work again. Yeah. Thank you. Jesus. So you're going, wait, weren't you like. Weren't you four days a week anyways, or like three and a half or something? I was I was five days a week, four hours a day. Oh, um, okay. So they like had me every day, but just for a little bit of time. So Sounds like yeah, regular just, hookups. It's like you were friends with benefits with your job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, in some ways, I, th I think honestly, like it is kind of a big ask to try to get somebody in like five days a week, four hours a day. Yeah, it you know, is. As opposed to like three days a week, eight hours a day or whatever it is. Precisely. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. No, tack those on to the other days. Don't make me come in on those. It's just like yeah. you're going to you're gonna every single day. This. Yeah. Please come in Saturday, Sunday as well and make every day two hours. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just spread it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are you, Robert? Anything new? Anything you want to? Um, well, whereas you have now gotten well into the thick of a new job, I just started mine last week. I'm very excited about it. I am doing um, learning and development, which is something I'm very passionate about. And I am actually leading a team. So I'm going to build a team, which I'm very excited about. And <gasps> it's Robert's going, wow. showing off his dominant side. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to show him how to learn. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, this goes out in public, Robert. <laughs> Uh, no, it's um, it's great. Yeah, no, the company's been great. Team's been great, and I get to go to Lithuania tomorrow night. So I'm going to go. Oh my hell team. yeah! Yeah, very exciting. Um, uh, jobs, jobs are just you know. How does this sound to you? We work to live. We don't live to work. Does that feel true? Well, you're one of two types. I find most people is one of the two, and I'm definitely. A work to live person. Mm -hmm. I do. I am not like. I learned this early on in my career that I'm defined more by the like multiple facets of my life, and work is just one of them. There's so many other yeah. things that I want to be doing that involves like, and it could be considered work, like volunteering stuff. You know, that what I do with queer prov and that that part of who, what it is, and it's it's work that I'm not getting paid for, but it's worth it, and I enjoy it. You know. Yeah. 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 I was talking to my coworker about this and I was like, we're all just trying to like ride that line between like, we don't want to be bored, but we also don't want to be so stressed out, like, cause we're so busy or like so overworked, but like, we want to be interested. We want to be occupied and like solving problems. So like, yeah, I don't know. You just kind of find the best balance that works for you. I feel like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and like imagine a world where everyone didn't have to work. Like the reason we work is because of currency, because of the capitalist economic system Ugh. and we need money to get by. Let's let's admit that. However, if everyone just had the money that they needed or there was no currency, like there was that wasn't an issue. So we're in Star Trek days now, right? Where it's just about mm -hmm. like you get the job that's right for you. I don't think people would just like sit around and be lazy. Some people, but I think most people would still want to create and invent and research and, and you know, like, in fact, you wouldn't be able to sit around and watch TV if this was true of our world because nobody would have invented TV if everyone was sitting around. So I think humans <laughs> innately want to mm -hmm. create and do things. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, man. Yeah, maybe we'll just do an episode about universal income because I definitely Ooh. want to read more about it before like re getting really firm on a stance. I'm putting because I want to hear more list. of like, the arguments against. Say again. I'm putting it on the list. Yeah, because it is exactly what you're saying. I think there's just a fundamental tension between like, will society come to a standstill if no one has to work, kind of thing. Um, and it's like. 
No, I think we're getting technologically advanced enough that a lot of like shit jobs will just be done by robots. And then it does make some space for people to actually think about their interests and their passions and how they want to like move through the world. Oh, hell yeah. But it's ideological, baby. <laughs> it's yeah. like, it's a paradigm shift. And there will always be people to maintain those robots, right? So even if we have robots that replace our jobs, somebody's got to take care of the robot. So. Yeah, someone's got to take care of those robots. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we can't just have robots taking care of robots. Yeah, then literally. we're looking at Wally. -E. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, we're gonna end up with Wally -E or a really dirty R two D two, and nobody wants a dirty R two D two. So we're gonna be polishing <laughs> yeah. him, oiling him, yeah, brushing him, giving him therapy, <laughs> well, robo therapy. I don't want to ruin the lore of R two D two, but there was a man inside him the whole time. <laughs> kind of like David. Hey, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Um, today we're talking about the inner child. <laughs> <laughs> what a transition. <laughs> so this is inspired by a book called The Journey from Abandonment to Healing by Susan Anderson. Um, I'm still reading the book, but it just started, you know, it started touching a chord and uh, resonating with a lot of stuff that I've been learning over this past year that I wanted to focus on one part of it in particular, which was an exercise related to talking to your inner child. So, uh, yeah, this is going to be a little different from our previous discussions. It's less like back and forth questioning and more just like, I don't know, a bit more open. Mm -hmm. Never mind. When we do the two person episodes, it is very back and forth. <laughs> but when we do the three person, we have a very like um, structured set of questions. Anyway, <sighs> where to begin? <laughs> So I guess I'll start by saying this uh, Susan Anderson person, she goes, um, there are five stages to like figuring out feelings of abandonment. And it's an acronym that she calls SWIRL. Uh, and so it goes shattering, withdrawal, internalizing, rage, and lifting. So it is somewhat similar to stages of grief. But uh, yeah, she puts her spin on it. So shattering is, of course, like that initial shock, that like first realization, like, oh, shit, like I've been abandoned and just like getting real about that. And she says mm -hmm. that stage is so much about like self-care and trying to stay present versus spiraling. Mm -hmm. And then withdrawal is this feeling of wanting to win the abandoner back this feeling of oh something God. must be wrong with me something must be like within my control that i can do um to try to get them back and it's in this stage that she focuses on an exercise of talking to the inner child because in her opinion so many abandonment wounds are basically like they have some roots in childhood like it just awakens primitive human feelings in us and um that's why it's important mm -hmm. to talk to the inner mm -hmm. child and be like okay well like what's actually coming up like what are you scared of what well, like where do you need comfort how can we comfort you kind of thing so that's what i was looking at does this sound relatable robert <laughs> oh yes but like <laughs> for different reasons i think mm -hmm. probably the general concept of abandonment you know probably traditionally you would associate that with being like i'm a kid and mom leaves or dad leaves or something mm -hmm. along those lines whereas for me the relatable quality is very much about an ex it's about being mm -hmm. completely just like like abandoned and tossed aside for someone else and mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. one of the most devastating things i've ever experienced Yep. Yep. It really is. So like, so when you said the word shattering is, that for assess is like, that's exactly how I felt. I felt shattered. I felt completely broken apart. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's like the reason she calls it swirl is because she feels that until we fully resolve these feelings, they'll go in cycles and we'll just be at like different parts of the cycle at different moments. They'll mm. literally swirl around within us, which is so lovely her, and I think very true. Her um, alliteration, so much, alliteration her, her acronym is also like works as a whole word for the general process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really beautiful. She's like a lovely writer as well. So uh, this is something I'm kind of putting together lately. Um, 
because I've talked about avoidance before on the podcast, and I think we've alluded to attachment theory. And I do actually have a guest tapped for um, like a pretty much expert in attachment theory <laughs> to Ooh. possibly come onto the pod. Um, but yeah, so much of my work over the years has been around avoidance and like what is the opposite of avoidance? Vulnerability. And so, so much of like, I think this was literally just yesterday. Um, I was just like avoidance in a family system creates feelings of abandonment because you have a group of people who aren't really taking care of each other, who aren't really there for each other. They're like physically mm. there, but they might not be emotionally there. Um, it feels and that like can create that. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like a drawn out version of abandonment, right? As opposed yeah. to like just leaving one day or like dumping you or walking away or whatever. It's like, I'm here, but I'm not going to be available to you. A little bit more sinister. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's that thing of being there, but not there, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if that makes sense. So uh, what then happens is it like informs a child's attachment style. Like we'll get into this in another episode, but attachment styles are formed in childhood and they're based on like very primary like things, like literally like they start when a child is like crying for their parents and mm. whether or not they receive like you know quick soothing or reliable soothing from the parent it's mostly about consistency than it's about like uh you know the like nice things that the that the kid gets it's yeah, it, yeah. anyway we'll talk about it more another time <laughs> versus those but, kids um, are just given chocolate when they cried and then they create a whole other yeah. weird association to love i know yeah no it's so true there's like a lovely quote from jerry seinfeld of all people he's talking to john mulaney and john mulaney's like ah, i'm kind of worried about becoming a dad i feel like i don't know uh how does he phrase it he's like what if I do the wrong thing or like, what if I don't give them what they need? And Jerry Seinfeld goes, Jerry Seinfeld goes, well, all they need is you. And John Mulaney goes, oh, that's nice. <laughs> but I think that's so true. <laughs> it's just like he didn't hear the depth of what he was saying. It's like true. All you need, all they need is for you to be there for them and to support them. Uh, and I think every parent, especially first time parent goes through that am I going to do something wrong? Am I going to break them? Am I going to screw something up? And it's just like, I think we're more resilient than we think. And mm -hmm. uh, like children can go through a lot, but what is needed is just support and being there. Yeah, exactly. Just that. Uh, uh, it's like our catchphrase of just like honesty and open communication. Like, <laughs> you know, always age appropriate, of course, but like, yeah, just the sense that like if your kid can talk to you about anything, like then you have done the most you can to like build a safe space for them. And then it's basically up to them to go through life and all its ups and downs. Yeah. Um, so, you know, making peace with one's parents is uh, it takes work, right? It takes active like attention um, because like. I think it's very easy to start playing the blame game and like kind of remove personal responsibility and like remove a sense of agency about like whether we're going to be okay, so to speak. Mm. Um, or for example, I think I mentioned previously, I'm a disorganized attacher. So I just have aspects that are anxious and avoidant, um, mm. which can be exhausting. And like my therapist asked me, is there any resentment, David, about your attachment style as you received it from your parents and i'm like uh i don't know is there <laughs> oh crap um, there's another thing i need to have anxiety over yeah damn it so it's an interesting thought uh but like yeah i don't know if you're comfortable talking about making peace with your parents robert but that's something you and i have talked oh, yeah, about a bit. totally we've talked about it enough might as well bring it to the world <laughs> let it shine <laughs> Was there anything you wanted that to was say? It. <laughs> that was, yeah. yeah. I guess my question to you is like, uh, yeah, if you're comfortable answering, what mm. do you think was like one of the harder parts of making peace with your parents? Probably knowing that like there's limits to what you can do to fix yeah. them, so to say. That, you know, there's always, it's like there's always things you want to do to better a situation, especially with like I'm, you know, 
part of my personality type is I'm a crowd pleaser. I want to make sure people are happy that things are going well. You know, I don't want to um, see uh, dissonance and people being upset. So there's a lot of different ways that you try to like fix that by like, you know, sometimes it's as simple as just being like present and showing up. Other times it's about like talking to them. Um, oh, I just got the T reminder from my display. <laughs> Time. Nice. Um, I, yeah, sometimes it's, yeah, it's like talking to them separately, trying to intervene, uh, trying to do things that the other person's like, if there's a fight over a thing to be like, I'll do that so that you don't have to fight over mm -hmm. it anymore. You know, it's trying to like make up for it. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, what, what I had to come to terms with is that like my parents are who they are and uh, there's things that I'll never be able to fix. Um, so I'm just going to work on my relationships, me to them and not them to each other. Cause that's not me. That's not my responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. That was my whole year. <laughs> like basically, I don't know, but from like May to May, May, 2020 to the following May, um, where I was just like, Oh, I just wish there was more I could do and just getting so involved and taking it so personally. And I think a lot about this quote from adult children of emotionally immature parents where she goes, uh, you must let go of this belief that if your parents loved you, they would also understand you. And I was just like, ooh, mm. oh, no, <laughs> oh that just oh, that's so brutal. <laughs> but it's like it's true unfortunately like it's exactly what you said there i think there is an aspect of like we want to fix our parents so that they can then be there for us you know yeah, yeah um and like be more supportive or understanding and like give us the support that we want or need and um, i think that's part of like so it's like sorry go, go on i'll go i'll go i was just gonna say that um <laughs> i think it's part of like that greater concept that I think we all struggle with at various points in life around there are things we just don't have control over and we have to come to peace with them. And that's yeah. part of that wheelhouse is that we don't have full control over that relationship that your parents have to each other or ultimately how they might treat you as a result of that relationship of like what they're doing, like their emotional availability and their attention to you. Um, you don't have control over that. You don't have control over their actions and their actions towards each other. You just have control over what you do to try to contribute to that relationship. And anything beyond that is on them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And it's like, you know, that's what uh, the author talks about in adult children of emotionally immature parents. She goes like, you really have to just like know your limits know your limit and stay within it. <laughs> um, oh, it's like gambling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause it's just like truly with some parents, like you just don't speak to them very much. You really limit your engagement with other parents. You maybe call them once a week um, with others. Maybe you like visit and sleep over, but there are just certain topics that you remove yourself from because they're too triggering. Like you just find that balance for you. And so much of it is it, so much of it is about getting in touch with like what is making you uncomfortable like why is that so frustrating um and for me it's usually just like i just want to be paid attention to <laughs> yeah like yeah it's pretty yeah. much what it is <laughs> yeah sometimes or it's just like i don't know but i i developed over years of kind of struggling with those issues of I built up this like guard that I'm like was always on edge. Like vigilance became a massive thing for me where it's like always waiting for the yeah. next thing, the next problem, the next fight, the next issue just around the corner. And so it's like, you always have the shield up and, and you're investing so much energy into holding up that shield. You don't have this, you know, the amount of energy you should have to focus on other things, be it yourself or your relationship with them or whatever that might be. And mm -hmm. it takes time to bring that thing down, but it has to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, our parents push our buttons because they're the ones who installed them. Right. Like mm. <laughs> there's only going to be that one down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know where I got it from. I didn't come up with it, but oh. like it just will probably always be triggering on some level. 
but it's up to us to like just either choose to engage or choose to try to deactivate or like you know regulate our own reaction um and with enough practice it gets easier yeah. So I, the last thing I wanted to say about this topic was, uh, I wanted to be vulnerable and share Ooh. the dialogue I had with my inner child or part of it. Um, oh, do it, do it. If I may, if I may read from my diary. Everyone pull up some popcorn and a cozy blanket. It's story time. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. Let me, <laughs> let me find the, the moment. Um, Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, um, disclaimer, if you are my parents or you are an ex or a previous roommate, and for some reason you've listened this far into the podcast, um, just know that I hold positive regard for you. This is not meant as an attack. This is just a personal experience of mine. (laughs) So it goes, um, uh, all right. So, And the lines are very blurred. Like, I'm not talking like a baby when I'm talking as, like, the little person. Sorry, let me set the stage a bit better. Um, So you're just going to read read it out as, like, in a child's voice. And it's like, this is going to be weird. (laughs) I I mean, I might. We'll see. We'll see how it feels. But uh, (laughs) so what Susan Anderson talks about to do this exercise is to basically, like, paint a portrait of your inner child. She calls it the little you Mm -hmm. and the big you. And Mm -hmm. so she says the little you is very much about your feelings and your inner world. And the big you is your behavior and your outer world. Like, can you visualize yourself being responsible, doing esteemable actions, like just being a capable person? Mm -hmm. And so just like make a little list of like, okay, what are all the ways that you are capable and you have like done things that you are proud of? Um, And then what are the feelings or like the motivations that drive your inner child the little you so like i won't get into them but that's basically how to kind of make them clear and then just because i'm a visual person i like drew a picture of like a little (laughs) david and then a big david Mm -hmm. and that helped a lot so okay so here's the here's the dialogue um little goes i've gotten to the point where it doesn't matter Uh, where sexual validation and superficial validation doesn't matter as much as the mutual care and understanding. Big says, that sounds like it's been a hard lesson. Little says, it has. Big says, why? Little says, because it's hard to find mutual care and understanding with my parents, with my last roommate, with my exes. Big says, were those people capable of that kind of connection? Little says, not really. Big says, then why does it bother you? Little says, because I want a mom and dad. Big says, hmm, can I be your mom and dad? Little says, I don't know. What if it doesn't feel as good as a real mom and dad? Big says, well, chances are it won't. But do you have a frame of reference? Little says, not really. Big says, so if I take care of you, would things get that much worse than they are now? Little says, no. It would probably help a lot, actually. Big says, I think so. But you can always tell me if you have ideas for how I can help you. Does that sound fair? Little says, that sounds really nice. Big says, so can I be your mom and dad for the next while? Little says, yes, please. Um, (laughs) Big says, what's the first thing you need? Little said, (laughs) hugs and to tell me it'll work out okay. And Big says, of course, gives hugs. It's going to be okay. I'm here for you. Um, so as you're doing that exercise like the whole point thank you that's very sweet (laughs) the whole point is to just put yourself mentally in both of those roles like really it's it is like an improv game of like okay can i embody my child what does my child need okay can i embody myself as an adult what does the adult think is the wise thing right Mm -hmm. and just like slowly build that rapport and uh susan anderson goes like It takes time uh, with some people like they'll find their inner child is really chaotic and just like not agreeable and like all of that stuff. But, you know, I think because I've done so much therapy, like I was just like ready to go there. Um, So it was it was seriously like it was a big moment for me of just like that 
actually feeling comforted, I guess, by parenting myself. I think I'd always known that that would be a useful thing, but it was more whatever theoretical, I guess. But like, yeah, just doing that exercise like felt very real. Awesome. Thanks for That's listening. That's great. Of course. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. It sounds like essentially the big person and based off the context of the book is those external factors, the behaviors and the external world in which you exist and kind of like how you behave externally as opposed to internally, which is the little, the big is just as capable of giving you those things as the, you know, as the exes and the parents and the, you know, the external people. So your external world, meaning you and your behaviors and that um, can do that. And, and that's what I'm hearing in that dialogue is it was a realization around like, I need to find it within myself. It can't be internally, entirely external. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, I always am wary of that feeling of like, well, I'll just be 100% independent and not yeah. need anybody like you can overcorrect. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that's where I'm headed. I think I am just getting to that place of like asking more for what I need. And like mm-hmm. if people can give that great. But if not, it's not the end of the world. Like I just am getting more familiar with what I need. It's like saying you're independent enough. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, because that's one of the things I was actually going to challenge it as like, well, at the end of the day, because of that great line you put of like your parents are the best ones to push your buttons because they're the ones who installed them the there are installed buttons innately within us and there's certain like yeah. relationship types that you like right like where you're going to feel more cared for you're going to feel like you can let go and feel release and feel like somebody is going to be there for you that's undeniable i don't think you can entirely be like i'm all my own woman and i'm wandering the world like, exactly i think you will get that and there are people who are very much that there's a reason we have that trope of the like strong independent woman and the world traveler who never needs anybody because i think mm-hmm. they still find it in some external factors there's other types of yeah. relations they have they could be one night stand short-term things whatever serial monogamists and stuff like that but yeah do you like do would you agree like i feel like we'll never fully be the big will never be a hundred percent of what we need. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, Anderson kind of talks about this very lovely idea. Well, two thoughts. She goes, um, someone asked in some like live Q and a, like, do you need to be fully healed before you enter your next relationship? And she goes, no, like just go in with the positive intention to be more honest, ask for your needs, like be a mature person, all of these things and you can still end up in a roller coaster but a lot of healing will still happen in relationship like versus just by yourself um so just like be real about it and yeah. you might be surprised at how like healthy that is and the second thought is um i lost it give me a sec um well I was, while you think about that i was just gonna say i have the yeah. insight of like you know it's helpful sometimes when that person you know, similar to how you ask for stuff, might know what they want and be honest about what they want and not string you along while they're trying to figure that shit out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I like, know. Uh, I know. Uh, I know. <laughs> uh, oh, man, that's going to bug me. What was the second thought? Um, did it have- independence, building resources. Yes. So she goes, um, Okay, so when we deal with abandonment, it's this feeling of like deprivation of like, ah, shit, like I'm going to miss that person so much. I need that person to feel complete, question mark. Mm. Um, So her thought is we give that power to other people. So really that power is ours because we like labeled that person as worthy, right? So how do we get to the place where we recognize where that power initially came from. And that's about that being independent enough or being more independent, um, having like that stable back and forth with your inner child and realizing like your own inner resources. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. So that's our little blurb on the inner child. Let's do some improv. So today, (laughs) um, if you find any of this interesting, definitely send us an email. Uh, to bitbuttbiz at gmail.com or tweet me at bitbutton. I'm very curious uh, 
about your thoughts just click out there click the, the box up in the corner or the link down here or the yeah. thing inside david or <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> the thing inside david <laughs> the robot don't click it <laughs> don't click it unless you're in the same room as me <laughs> hey um so we're gonna do some improv we're gonna start with a couple videos uh i thought it would be fun to break down so yes. let me just set up the screen share real quick okay play it play it play it should i watch it independently or watch your screen share uh watch my screen okay okay so this first clip is talking about the toxic chill girl bro why are you being so loud right now no like you're literally screaming are you okay yeah okay <laughs> can we just like oh my god look why is she dancing like that dude i told you she can't handle her fucking liquor oh where are you going tonight you're going to the thing downtown yeah i'm good no i'm sure it'll be like fun for you but i'm i'm definitely good <laughs> <laughs> did it just make your skin crawl <laughs> just the layers of judgment and like between yeah. the line statements you know it's just uh you know especially that first part like the first dialogue she's giving reminds me of that person who is like classically does not know how to validate somebody's feelings you know, who's like, you're yep. being too much or you're overdoing it or, you know, they're just like, because they might be chill, they might be not involved in whatever scenario doesn't mean that the other individual can't be fucking feel, you know, like, oh, exactly. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. The toxic chill girl, toxic chill person, let's be honest, um, is so like. Oh, they just can't handle enthusiasm, you know, <laughs> like they're just like, but if they're enthusiastic and I don't know why, or like, I can't join them, then that makes me feel left out. So I'll just like shoot them down. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, just yeah, like, yeah. Really? Bring them to my level. And that level is as like flat and placid as it can be, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Um, I, yeah. And, and I've struggled actually with this in uh date slash relationships and that when like I've encountered people I'm like where you're almost too chill. I start getting weirded out by it. I'm like, where are your levels? Like as an actor, mm -hmm. as a performer, I'm like, show me some scale. Yeah. Show me some levels. <laughs> show me like that you have diversity and of and mm -hmm. your interest. And also like to me, beyond that, it's also just about passion. Like if you like, there's got to be stuff that you're passionate about in life that you want to do. Like why is it, why is life so complacent for you that you don't give a sh like shit about other people's excitement? Like, ooh, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, I know. Oh, God. When she goes, are you OK? <laughs> like, of course we're OK. We're yeah. like in a good mood. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Are you, are you OK? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Oh. OK. Yeah. Can we just like. Oh, my God. oh yeah. Yeah. Can yeah, yeah. We just <laughs> Can like... we just like. <laughs> and you're not. Can you you're just not control even... yourself. Yeah, I know. And it's like you're not even worth the like statement this like this alone should show like you should it's almost like you should know how much you're being how how to yeah, you know like oh god <sighs> yeah yeah and that's like that's huge right i think um oh what's her name great writer great author when someone says you're doing the most right now like as if it's good to somehow like do the least or like just do average like there, yeah, there's just something very anti-passion, <laughs> like you yeah. said, yeah, yeah, about yeah, yeah. that kind of attitude. And yeah. and this idea of like, you also, uh, yeah, I think you touched on something important too of even going back to like the people pleasing or the fixing or whatever. Mm -hmm. People who are like so like low baseline and like whatever, you can't get a read on them. I think mm -hmm. two things are happening. I think it's like, they seem mysterious and that's kind of frustrating. Um, but it's also like we're at you and I are at a certain level, a certain vibration where <laughs> if we're not being mirrored to a certain degree, that's just frustrating. That's draining for us. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 They were literally called mirror neurons. Right. And they're meant yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to use to mimic the energy of another individual in order to relate to them and socially create connection. 
And so people yeah. who seem to be like this chill girl who just like cut all those fucking neurons or something. I don't know what. It's just like it does. Yeah. It is frustrating at times. And you know what's the salt in the wound for me is one thing to mm. kind of have that mentality and approach. But the second thing is to not have enough interest or energy to really explain yourself or go into the detail. Like where it's just like she's so That's complacent so that she's like... Yeah. I'm going to judge what you're doing, but also I'm not going to really explain why. I'm just going to generally be judgy. And it's like, Wah. no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. To not even finish the sentence. To to say, can you just like? <laughs> <laughs> it's so it's so toxic ah. because like it is bad communication. It is invalidating. It's like all of those things. And yeah, like I've had experiences like that where, um, a recent one was like I was building a running habit and I came home and then it actually happened twice <laughs> uh, where with two different people um, I come home and then this first person was just like hey David you know you can just relax and I was just like I enjoy running what <laughs> like where is that coming from <laughs> yeah. like I can like I can almost see how they think they're being cool or they think they're being like whatever mm -hmm. but yeah there was just something about it that was very invalidating and then the second time was like i set a personal best and i was talking about it to someone in the house and i was like yeah i like beat my new record for four miles and the person was like oh <laughs> and i was just like thanks anyway <laughs> <laughs> moving on uh, yeah yeah, it's just like, you know, we don't have to be excited about the same things, but you can at very at the very least like reflect someone else's excitement. It just shows such a lack of mirroring, like you said. Yeah. I think yeah. we're belaboring the point. <laughs> uh -huh. Um shall we do some improv? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So uh, I wrote here open scene. Um so if you want to bring up a word generator or something, sure. just as like our inspiration i'm i'm sure it'll be it'll be something <laughs> well it's gonna be a thing suit stubborn initiative it it doesn't fit i don't know i'm i'm we, not i'm i'm not feeling great about this one honey you buttoned it up <laughs> wrong it's like you've got the buttons all over the place oh, okay all right all right i'll start over um is the salesperson still here um, I think they I think they just went to get a tie. I, I they're finding okay. something that's gonna match. You, you gotta look God, the God, part. God get damn yourself to oh, calm down. We're not doing this again. Just get yourself together. It's gonna be a great presentation. You're gonna kill it, okay? Look, Jeff, I know you believe in me. I know you're my superior here at Microsoft, but like I uh I I don't know if I should have started this role. Um I fuck I did them wrong again <laughs> not right for the role you're the man who managed to bankroll five different startups and turn them into multi-million dollar organizations I think you're the man for this job okay Jeff I I gotta come clean man what like your shirt <laughs> yeah yeah um Jeff those were multi-level marketing schemes wait what the, um, those were not legitimate businesses. They were, um, I was selling skincare products. I was selling, um, what else? I was selling essential oils. Uh, are you I was telling me that magazine subscriptions? I just, I needed a legitimate job, man. I did not expect to be promoted so quickly. It was the whole thing. Are you telling me surfboards for cats wasn't a real product? Oh my <laughs> God. I ordered 10 of those online. I'm still waiting for them to deliver. That's why they're taking so long. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm glad I'm I'm glad that you told me that because then I could just circle the money back to you. But Jeff, uh, dude, I've never given a legitimate business presentation in my life. All I can do is lie. We just acquired a whole new company to Microsoft, hoping to turn this into something. You're the man to lead this. What are we going to do? OK, well. I do think that pet internet has some legs, okay? I do think that we can find some way to bring our pets into the internet of things. I do think that's fundamentally like a decent idea, but I have no execution knowledge, Jeff. Do you? 
I mean, I am literally just the stylist to all of our employees. I, I, I oh. Yeah, thought, you didn't wait, know. So That's why I'm here with you. I'm the stylist. I might have been there during the interview process, but they needed somebody outside the department. Oh, Jeff, I was under the impression that like you put in a good word for me. I mean, I, I vouch for you because you seem like a nice guy and I really like the idea of pets for the Internet. I've always yeah. wanted to connect my cat to the Internet. I want to know what she's doing all the time. You know how many cats yeah. I have? Ten. That's why I ordered ten surfboards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Okay, Jeff. I mean, this might be weird, but like, can you just join me in the presentation? I know you say you're just a stylist, but I, hate I think if I have speaking, you wonder why I have ten cats. They're the only people I talk to. Meowsers is generally pretty judgmental of me when I do presentations, and I'm still getting over that. Okay, you practice presentations with your cat. Cut yeah. to that. <laughs> <laughs> I said cut to that. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm here today. Uh, I was here today to uh, tell you about this new product launch from Microsoft. It's... Uh, oh, go oh, God. Why, why, why are you crawling up to me, Meowsers? Meowsers, what? <laughs> Meowsers. Meowsers, I'm sorry. I, I, I'll do better next time. <laughs> I'll do better. <laughs> 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 Okay, come back. <laughs> yeah, it didn't go well, to say the least. Okay. <sighs> well, Jeff, I I'm in a real bind. I'm like, I'm sweating. Do you see all this sweat, man? Yeah, I can I see it through your two layers. I'm staining this new shirt. <sighs> you know, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm really in a pickle. Um, I'll let you know how it goes. But if it goes badly, do you think we could, like, get coffee sometime? Sure. I mean, would you still want to see me if you lose the deal? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. Because it's really it's not about the suit, right? It's about the, the man in the suit. Oh, God. You're so right. That's what I saw. I saw beyond your suit during that interview. And I saw something that I liked. That's why I vouched for you. I want to see okay. what's inside that suit up on that stage. Okay. And then maybe All later right, for coffee. Shot. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know how it goes. All right. So we'll cut to the presentation. All right. I would like to thank everyone for gathering here. Today we have uh, Miles Diedrich presenting his newest proposition to take Pets for Internet to the next level. Uh, everyone here at Pets for Internet is super excited that we've been acquired by Microsoft. And we're really excited to hear about what our future uh, is being held up with um, with this new acquisition. So please, Miles, tell us all about it. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's so good to have you here. Uh, and thank you for having me. Um, pets. We all love our pets. They're a member of the family, right? So. We here at Microsoft believe everybody in your family should be on the internet, should be on a device of some kind. Otherwise, our business will die. Now, if we can bring pets into that fold, that's excellent for the bottom line, because that is, if let's say there's, oh, 100 million families in the United States alone. Let's say half of those families have a pet at least one pet that could be device worthy. That's another 50 million devices that we're going to be able to put out there into the world and into the environment, which we got to do. So pet internet, the way this works is bringing your pet into the internet of things. What that means is you can track their location, you can track their mood, their hunger levels, and their sociability with other animals. As we build a network of pets, we will have an absolutely stunning amount of data that we can continue to exploit from all of our shareholders as well as users. So as the new head of this project, what I'm looking for from each of you is ideas. That's where we are right now. And then we're going to be gathering some research, running some tests on some models and designing some peripherals that we're going to be attaching to some of your pets to see how much you like it. 
Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Now, I'm just going to put forward one question that came up recurringly as we did some market research about this yeah, concept. Sure. Um, oddly enough, 90% of the respondents to our over 5,000 uh, surveys that we sent out, the demographic was generally 45 plus middle-aged white women who um, were single or with family, but empty nesters. And the recurring okay. question that came coming back from these women who might I note had cats in the excess of 10 plus. Oh yeah. What yeah, is yeah, yeah. going to happen if I connect my cat to the internet? Will she lose her identity? That's a beautiful question because at the heart of it, is whether or not pets have identities or if they are just objects that we keep in our home that we pretend have identities. And I think that's beyond my pay grade. We're going to bring on the Dalai Lama now to discuss consciousness and pets. Got to that. <laughs> Today I have the Dalai Lama with us, a special guest during this presentation who's going to actually talk to you about how cats, dogs, Animals of all shapes and sizes have consciousness. Dalai Lama? Hello. So you tell us that animals have a consciousness. How do we have proof of this? Mm. When you look into something's eyes and it looks back, it is alive. Thank you. Wow. That's so insightful. After hearing for 30 years from my husband that he looked in my eyes and saw that I was dead inside, it is just so refreshing to hear that finally somebody thinks I have a life. <laughs> Thank you. All right. You. What? You are beautiful. You have the breath of God inside you. Oh, I, I, I eat my cat's cat food. That's probably why. We all have the hunger. Okay, let's cut to Jeff. Let's get to Jeff and Kyle after this like presentation has all wrapped up. Wow. You did I, it, man. I, I think I think it went well. Yeah. I genuinely think it went well. I think so too. Did you see how excited they were? There was people just attaching various internet devices to their animals left, right, and center right after the presentation. They feel like they've got a future. Wow. Jeff, I feel like I learned a really valuable lesson today. I personally attached a modem to each one of my cats so that they could be connected to the internet. And I have you to thank for that. That's really sweet. Um, between you and me, Jeff, Yeah. I don't think you should do that. Wait, and what? the lesson I learned today was working in high level corporate, in the high level corporate world really isn't that different from running multi-level marketing schemes. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I just attached 56k bot modems to each of my cats and you're telling me this was a bad idea and that this is a scheme? Oh, it's definitely a bad idea, but at least I'm not going to get arrested. You Isn't that cool? Of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> throw my cats at you. <laughs> <laughs> oh god, oh Jesus. <laughs> See. Sweet. That feels like scene. Right. Um fun. Right. Uh, that brings us to the end of today's show. Robert, what's your takeaway? I love that you integrated all the words of suit stubborn and initiative into that scene. It was all in there. Also, mm. that um, we do need to first and foremost, you know, the classic work on yourself and find that sense of completion within yourself, but know that you will like, it is okay to know that it's not entirely from yourself. We are social animals. And we are seeking yeah. other people out there. And so you want to find people who reciprocate that sense of what makes you feel good. Thank you so much for listening to Tissues of the Day. You can follow me, David, at BitButton on Twitter and Instagram. And you can follow Robert at Robert F. Mackay on Instagram. Subscribe to BitButton on YouTube and turn on notifications. You can listen to the audio wherever you get podcasts. Finally, if you loved this show, you can always donate at patreon.com slash bitbutton. Stay wet, Internet. Thank you for the translation. <laughs> <laughs> that translated the entire one hour episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For the cat at the very end. Our cat demographic. They're listening. They're listening. <laughs>
They are listening. Yeah, our podcast is great for keeping your pets company at home. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> David's voice Bye. is known for being soothing. <laughs> Bye. Aww.